Okay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Mr. Hopper. Mr. Hopper is a partner at the Austin law firm of Hopper McKeska PLLC. After graduating from college from the University of Texas at Austin, Mr. Hopper obtained his JD from Duke University School of Law. Following law school, Mr. Hopper clerked for the Honorable Guy Herman of Travis County Probate Court Number 1 and has worked in probate and estate planning for 17, well, 18 years now, right? Mr. Hopper is a board certified uh, state is board certified in estate planning and probate law. is a current member of the probate and estate planning section of the Austin Bar Association, as well as a member and formal council member of the State Bar of Texas Reptile Section. Mr. Hopper is both the former director and chairman of the Travis County Bar Association probate and estate planning section, and is listed in the best lawyers in America. Today, as Per usual, Mr. Hopper is presenting the Texas Estate and Trust Legislative Update. Join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Craig Hopper. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's a distinct pleasure because I started this, this uh, worldwide tour uh, last, uh, last year at this conference when the session had just begun and we were about... I don't know, maybe a couple months into it, and we didn't really know where our bills were going to be heading. And so since then, there have been, you know, lots of battle scars, and we came out with some good things through the reptile, and we're going to talk about those today. Uh, you know, not, it wasn't always easy, but whenever I remember about how that process was, I take comfort in looking at the current political climate and everything going on at the election and realize how easy it actually is down there at the Capitol. So... Um, a lot of students out there, uh, you've got a great, uh, great professor with, with Professor Byer and all of your teachers here, and this is a wonderful thing to get to be a part of. And I, I think you should all feel, pat yourselves on the back for all the hard work you do here. Uh, you've got a great career in front of you, uh, no matter how scared you are right now. I started off at, as working for a judge, and then I was at a big law firm, and then went out on my own. And, uh, and have been out on my own for several years and was, was just recently thinking, oh gosh, it's been so great. I need to do something special for my 10 year anniversary of being out from the big firm, which uh, uh, was March 1 of this year. And so then I'm getting ready and then I look back and I realize it was actually my 11th year. So, you know, time flo flies by, so pay attention to everything and, and make sure you hit those milestones, especially the ones you can be proud of. So, uh, and this is something I'm proud of, is the work that we've done. I am currently the Estate and Trust Legislative Affairs Committee for the State Bar's Real Estate Probate and Trust Law section, which is quite a mouthful, especially when you have to write it all down at the Capitol on your witness testimony cards. But uh, what that means is that uh, I help shepherd all of the, uh, the bills that the Real Estate Probate Trust Law section tries to get forward and passed in in a legislative year. Uh, there's several people that are actually involved here today or the, 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 that were also part of that process. Uh, Jerry Beyer is the chair of our digital assets committee and so we're probably gonna be seeing some action on his committee at the upcoming session. And uh, Marjorie Stevens and, and Jeff Meyer were the co-chairs of our trust committee. So we have four main committees, the ones that we were uh, actively involved with in the last session, that was trusts, decedents, estates, guardianships, and advanced directives. And we're going to talk about a lot of those things. The paper that you have is a very, very, very large paper. There's lots of stuff in there, including things we passed, things we didn't pass, things that other people didn't pass, and just everything and anything that could have happened during the session. And it's authored by Bill Pargaman, who, what, who is currently the chair of, the, of REPTIL, the Real Estate Probate Trust Law section, and was the Estate and Trust Legislative Affairs Committee before that. So. Uh, I've learned a lot from him, and he has been kind enough to continue writing this opus uh, of a paper to cover everything that happened in 2015. So you're not going to be able to read everything in there, but uh, you can always go back and refer to it with any questions you have, because I can't cover everything in the 45 minutes I have. You'll see that you also get to name it yourself. Um, that was originally because we couldn't think of a good catchy title, but then as the session went on, we decided, hey, we'll make it interactive, so you can call it whatever you want. So, um, again, lots of stuff in here. We're going to try to hit on some of the high points that will affect your practice. Uh, like I said, we had four big bills, the decedent states, guardianship, trust, and our advanced uh, directives. You'll see that the trust bill, oh, and the, the advanced directives bills disappeared. We did not get those passed. Uh, we're going to be back with those next year, and we may talk a little bit about that today. The main ones that we passed, that Reptil passed, were the decedent states and the guardianship bills. 
before talking about those in great detail, um, uh, the, the, I'll tell you about some of the little things that we helped pass. Uh, one of them was that uh, there's now, it's clear that whenever there's a reference to the probate code in our documents or in the law, that it also means the estates code, since we changed over from the probate code to the estates code. I'm happy that I actually testified in both the House and the Senate on that bill, so thank you. It's, it's all because of me that that great piece of legislation passed. Uh, the real work was done by our substantive chairs, who uh, also showed up and gave some of the testimony on some of the harder things that we, we dealt with. Um, one thing to talk about first is that even though I talk about these as reptile bills, or some of these as reptile bills, they're, not, they're only reptile bills up to a point. So it goes through a big, long process. Uh, first, the reptile council meets and discusses p potential legislation. We, we fine-tune it. We massage the wording. Then it goes to the state bar, and the state bar approves it to make sure that we're we're doing things within those confines, and then it, we find a legislator to, to carry the bill after it goes and is rewritten by the Legislative Council. But once a legislator picks it up, it's their bill. And so sometimes things that we try to propose get tweaked a little bit, and it's uh, not something that we might have done, or things get added to our bill. So I like to say that if it's something that you like, we did it. If it's something that you didn't like, it was forced upon us. So, um, but in this paper, uh, or at least you'll see on the screen, the stuff that's in burnt orange that are part of a reptile bills are things that came from another source. About 95% of the times that is from the statutory probate judges uh, with uh, legislation that they wanted to see pass. And for whatever reason, their bills, it was easier to merge bills. And, and during all the sausage making, we ended up with where we are. Uh, so let's talk about what has passed. First uh, big thing to think about is the disclaimer bill that passed. This was part of the th one of the things that we proposed the reptile proposed, and what it does, it's going to clean up disclaimer provisions so that everybody can have it a little more user-friendly than it has been in the past. So instead of having to look at different sorts of sections to figure out exactly what rules apply, you can now look at the new property code, chapter 240. So what does it do? Well, the main thing to keep in mind that it does is it is not as fixed on a calendar deadline anymore because it's now being decoupled from federal law for, that, that governs federal disclaimers. So no longer is it a nine-month deadline. And instead, what you need to focus on and what is going to be most relevant is uh, on acceptance. So generally, if somebody has not accepted a benefit from a trust or from a state, then disclaimers are still a possibility for them, regardless of the time in which it is passed. Now, that is, that, that is still different if you're trying to meet certain federal disclaimer law purposes, but for other things that don't have uh, federal tax ramifications, it's going to be based on the acceptance uh, of any benefit. There's a great paper that Glenn Karish did, who was also a former chair of Reptil and also a former Legislative Affairs uh, Committee guy, who at his website at texasprobate.com if you want to look more into that. Keep in mind that if you do run into a disclaimer now, there is new law, and make sure you're doing it the right way. There are uh, actually better guidelines, so you'll know that you are doing it the right way. And it clarifies certain things like when, uh, w when courts need to approve disclaimers, and those include things that you would expect in a dependent administration, in a guardianship, uh, and in a disclaimer that results in property actually passing to the fiduciary so that you can reduce self-dealing uh, that way. So, uh, and, and also it clarifies when a trustee can disclaim property so that it doesn't fall into the trust. So that's one thing that we're, I think we'll probably see a lot more use of as we move forward. Uh, the statute also discusses the mechanics of how to disclaim. You can look at that in the paper. I want to go on to some of the more, uh, some of the other topics in the paper right now, but it is all in this paper and in Glenn's paper. Um, more disclaimer. So let's talk about the main decedents of states bill that Reptil was behind. And the, the biggest change in there is that now there is going to be greater possibility for us to reform wills that are offered for probate. So if, if you've ever dealt with the, the, par, the problem that's caused when there's a will that doesn't say what it's supposed to say, we were very limited in what we could do to try to fix that problem. So we could have a court make a ruling to construe a will and give us feedback uh, if there was an ambiguity in the will. So we had to actually show that there was an ambiguity in the will before a court can say what this ambiguity means to try to fix the problem. A lot of times, though, it's just a flat-out mistake that was in the will. So it wasn't an ambiguity. So if you don't have an ambiguity and you're stuck with a mistake, then the mistake is going to govern. 
So now what, uh, what we propose and is now law is that you can actually go to the court and seek relief to reform the will. It says modification or reformation, but it's really more of a reformation. And there are three main areas to do that in, and all these are going to be helpful to various practitioners. First is that you can, mod you can reform a will to comply with the testator's tax objectives. Usually a testator does not want to pay more tax if he, has to, if he doesn't have to. So if the tax law has changed since the will was created and there are benefits that can be, that the will can be reformed to, to, to make more funds go passed down to the beneficiaries, that's one way you can get in. Another important thing is that now we can reform wills to help beneficiaries qualify for governmental assistance. There are many wills out there that provide, say for example, a per stirpes distribution, and, but it turns out that some of the beneficiaries are either receiving governmental assistance or ultimately will receive governmental assistance, uh, be it through Medicaid or uh, whatever the governmental assistance may be. And normally, if we have enough foresight, we're going to put in special needs trust language inside our wills. But if that has not happened and you're probating a will and there's clearly a beneficiary who's going to get kicked off of Medicaid, you can now go to court and reform the will so that the share that goes to that beneficiary is now going to be protected and not be included when they count his means to determine whether or not he qualifies or continues to qualify for governmental assistance. So that's a great thing. The, the big C change is that now we can actually correct a Scrivener's error. So uh, if there is a mistake in the will, so this is just a, a time when the, the attorney drafting it has just messed up, but it's not an ambiguity. So what do you do? Well, now if the sufficient evidence can be provided, that mistake can be fixed and the will can be reformed. But under this, uh, this type of reformation, it is a higher evidentiary standard. So it's by clear and convincing, uh, as opposed to the standard preponderance of, of everything else there. So, so what, what does that mean? Probably it means that the best testimony is when the, uh, the scrivener will show up in court and say, yeah, I, I messed up. Uh, I meant to say this, or uh, it was, my notes were transcribed incorrectly, and I know what the testator wanted. This is what he wanted. Please fix it. And so that's, a, that's going to be a helpful tool. And uh, we, tr we try to get that into, uh, to allow the same sort of reformation for Scrivener's errors in trust, uh, but that bill didn't pass, but we should be back with that at the next session. Uh, a few other things on this page. Uh, the, now it's clear that you do not have to give an inventory to some of the beneficiaries who wouldn't automatically receive notice of the probating of a will. So if, you'll, if, if you've probated a will, you'll know that there are certain notices you have to give to people. And, but you don't have to give them to everybody, including people who've already received what they may inherit under the will, or people who have signed a waiver of notice, or somebody who receives a very small amount, less than $2,000 under the will. So even though that is in there, they don't get notice of the proceeding occurring of the will being admitted to probate, the statute still said, though, that they received a copy of the inventory. So now it's just kind of uh, making them dovetail so that if you don't get notice of a will, you also don't get notice of the inventory. So that way it's just, it cleans things up for all of us. Uh, we've also expanded some of the rules that deal with making sure that any sort of designations and bequests that were made to former spouses do not survive a divorce. So uh, we, we already had that in wills, and now we've extended that to certain pour over gifts to trust and powers of appointment and account designations. So, if something has been placed in writing before and then there's a divorce, those designations will not count for these new areas. We think we've caught almost everything. There may always be something new, but we've certainly tried to limit that since that's usually what clients want to see. Uh, a couple of provisions in the Reptil Bill also makes it easier to probate foreign wills. So when you're either on a border of another country or another state, you're often going to see wills that are prepared in that other area. And in the past, it's been, sometimes it can be difficult to have those wills admitted to probate because of uh, their forms and, and their idea of a self-proving affidavit or whatever the case might be, are not the same as Texas has. So uh, over the last several sessions, we've tried to uh, make it a little bit easier for those wills to be admitted to probate here without having to comply with every single Texas requirement. So that uh, basically if a will would be valid and self-proving in another jurisdiction, it should be valid and self-proving here in Texas. We would already provided that that would be the case for a testator's domicile, say they lived in New Mexico, 
But now we've also provided that it can be wherever a testator has a residence. So if somebody isn't just domiciled in New Mexico, but has a, uh, a residence there, and the will is signed perhaps when, when they're at this other home or this vacation home, then as long as it's valid there, and as long as the self-proving affidavit is valid there, then it can be admitted into uh, Texas as a self-proving uh, will. So we're just kind of broadening that. The um, few other little tinkering things have been done. One thing I'd point out is that they uh, noticed everyone about the probating of a will. It used to provide that you had to, uh, when you had to file something with the court that says, I've given the notice I'm supposed to give, you had to list all the beneficiaries' addresses. Well, beneficiaries don't really love that if they don't have to have their addresses as part of the public record. And so now they don't have to have that anymore. So we've taken that out of the Chapter 308 uh, affidavit. Uh, another thing to know is that there are new provisions of dealing with lawyer trust accounts. So as the attorneys out here know that you're, we have IOLTA accounts where client funds are supposed to be held. Well, sometimes if a sole practitioner passes away and they've got their IOLTA account, it's a little bit unclear, or has been unclear as to what that should happen with those accounts, because it's not part of the deceased attorney's estate, and instead it belongs to the clients, but you have to be an attorney to access those funds. And so in the past, we might have had to go to court to get a special person appointed to deal with IOLTA accounts. Well, now it's a little bit easier. Now, the independent executor, if they are not an attorney, can appoint an attorney to do all that without having to go to court for additional help or if the executor is already an attorney, they can do it themselves. A few other decedents of states bills were passed that uh, Reptil wasn't really, uh, was involved with. We monitored them and, and might have given some input, but uh, things to keep in mind here is that, one thing is that, well, the state inheritance tax is repealed, so there's that, that's a good thing. Uh, of course, you, you may know that that hasn't really been an issue for any of us in quite some time, but now there's a legislator that can go home to his jurisdiction and say, I was able to repeal the state inheritance tax. Um, we also have a simplified process for certain people to obtain intestate account information. And what does that mean? Well, basically, when somebody's trying to do a small estate affidavit in a probate court, you have to say what the value was of the bank accounts that the decedent had. But a bank is usually not gonna give that information unless there is an administration open. So in order to make small estate affidavits more user-friendly, uh, the, there was a push to allow the, to, to, to simplify the way that somebody can get that information. And so now a family member can go to court and say, I need to get information, and they can get that information from the bank. Um, now let's talk a little bit about guardianship. Uh, there's been a whole lot of changes in the guardianship world based on this past session not really ones that the reptile was behind, although we certainly had some things passed in our bill, but there have been lots of other new statutes to, to be aware of, especially if you do practice any sort of guardianship. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the reptile guardianship bill, some of the things that we've done there. Uh, one good thing that we've done is that we've clarified that when there's a guardianship that's been created in another jurisdiction, if you're moving that into, or into another, one county, if you're moving it into another county, you don't have to have two bonds. So the bonds can be expensive. You have to buy new, pay a new premium for each time you have a bond. And if there's a guardianship, it's just moving from one place to another, you shouldn't have to, it doesn't make sense, you should have to pay twice. And so now it's clear that the existing bond will, will satisfy the bond requirement while it's being transferred over. Uh, other things that uh, our bill did is it clarified that whenever costs of a guardianship proceeding can be, would be assessed against a guardianship of the estate, they can also be assessed against a management trust if the management trust was created essentially as a guardianship substitute. So uh, we, we usually have two choices if somebody's incapacitated and doesn't have a, a statutory durable power of attorney to allow somebody to manage their finances, and that's either to have a guardianship of the estate created or to have a guardianship management trust created. So they do the same thing, same sort of court supervision, there's different wrappers because usually a corporate fiduciary is the trustee of the guardianship management trust. And so this just clarifies that, uh, and there are a few other tinkerings in here where if, the, if there was a rule that applied to a guardian of the estate, it should also apply to the trustee of a guardianship management trust. One thing that's in orange, because this is a statutory probate court, 
uh, requirement that they wanted to put in deals with intervention in a guardianship. There have been some times where uh, uh, people ha who don't really have a good reason to intervene in a guardianship would intervene just to slow down the wheels of justice and to, uh, not, you know, not for good purposes at all, but in bad faith, try to slow down a process because technically in, before this statute, anybody could intervene in a guardianship, even if you didn't know the ward. And so now it's provided that if you are, uh, that if you want to intervene in a guardianship proceeding, you now have to tell the court that you want to intervene and explain why, and the court can deny that intervention. This doesn't mean it's going to make it harder for people who want to participate because this doesn't apply to the folks that are already necessary parties, which are going to include almost anybody who normally would be involved in a guardianship. But this would be so that if somebody really has no, no relationship at all with the, with the ward or the proceeding, they have to show why they want to be invited to the table. Um, another thing that has changed uh, to be aware of is that now criminal background checks are required for all proposed guardians. In the past, it used to just be that if you were a private professional guardian, you had to have a criminal background check. And instead, if you're a family member, say that I'm, I'm even a grandchild of a ward, and I become that, that my grandfather's guardian, then I didn't have to have a criminal background check because I was a family member. Well, eventually somebody realized, you know what? Probably not all family members have completely clean criminal records, and, and maybe the court needs to know about some of those things. And so now there's a criminal background check for all proposed guardians, even if you are a family member. But keep in mind that it still doesn't apply to lawyers. So if you're a lawyer and you want to be a guardian, as long as your criminal background has not disqualified you from being an attorney, you can, uh, nobody's going to find out about it. So, so that's a good thing there. Uh, another thing that our, the guardianship bill did is that it makes safekeeping agreements more user-friendly. Uh, safekeeping agreements are situations where in order to reduce the cost of a bond premium for a, for a ward, then the guardian and a bank uh, will enter into an agreement that basically says the bank will not let the guardian have access to any of those funds unless the court first approves it. And the court has to approve this safekeeping agreement. Well, in the past, there was a problem because those safekeeping agreements usually could not be entered into, or they, they could not be entered into until after the guardianship was created. But when the guardianship is created, you've got to set a bond for as much as whatever the guardian could theoretically steal, which is the full amount that was in the account. So let's say that you've got a ward who has $5 million in the bank. You don't want that to be you know, misused by the guardian, so the judge has to put a five, little over $5 million bond on the guardian. Then the guardian would qualify and then go back to the court and say, judge, I don't need all $5 million to manage this ward, so I want to put four and a half million or whatever amount of this into safekeeping uh, so they don't have to pay the bond premium on that additional four and a half million dollars. But by the time they've done all that, they've already paid for the first year, usually a non-renewable premium. So now uh, there's a way for us to go in ahead of time and save the ward those funds. So we don't have to pay the very, very large premium and instead can get those assets safe kept early on. One thing that the judges wanted to put into our, our bill that became law is that now with a temporary guardianship pending contest, uh, it's limited to nine months, and if it's going to go on past nine months, you've got to go to court and explain why it needs to go on longer. Now, the reason for this is that uh, whenever you've got a guardianship fight, say, usually it's going to be because you've got two family members fighting over who needs to be in charge, then there usually needs to be somebody there to look out for the ward. And so the court will appoint a temporary guardian pending contest. And then once the contest is resolved, usually the temporary guardian would go away. Well. Uh, there's not a whole lot of oversight required by the statute for a temporary guardian pending contest, and so uh, the court wants to make sure that things just don't go on forever without somebody trying to move forward and get it to a resolution. And so now the temporary guardian needs to come in within nine months to say, hey, the fight's still going on, we need more time, or whatever the situation might be, so the court has a reason to justify it continuing. Um, uh, the all management trustees now need to file their own initial inventories within 30 days. That's similar to what a guardian of the estate has to do. So this is just a, another example of where we're making trustees have the same responsibility as a guardian of the estate. Again, this is guardianship management trustees. So if the one of those is created instead of a guardianship of the estate, they need to tell the court, 
this is what is in the trust 30 days after qualification. Um, the, uh, I'd point to one thing down there at the bottom of this page where court investigators may compel discovery of a customer's financial information, especially relevant to the issue of elder abuse because what will often happen is that uh, a court gets notification from somebody on the outside that there is a potentially incapacitated person who's being exploited. So anybody can tell the court that, and if the court gets that information letter, then they have to either appoint an attorney to look into it as a guardian ad litem, or have their court investigator look into it if they are a statutory probate court. And usually if there is financial exploitation, the best way to get to the bottom of that quickly is to look at the bank records. But sometimes banks are reluctant to give those records, even though it's somebody from the court saying, give me those records. And so now uh, it's, it's the law that if a court investigator shows up and says, bank, you need to give me those records, the bank, it's gonna be more difficult for the bank to say, uh, I'm not going to do that. Because now the court can say, if you don't, I'm gonna file this motion, you're gonna be held in contempt of court and somebody will get thrown in jail or however they wanna pose that threat. So that is the reptil bill. The bill that probably affects everybody's day-to-day -day practices and creates a whole lot of new questions as well as a few answers is, uh, was House Bill 39. Uh, and just by show of hands, how many folks out here practice in guardianship areas or are licensed to do guardianships? Okay. So um, uh, this, this bill, the, the main thing this bill did is it, it introduced into guardianship world the concept of uh, supports and services and, <clears throat> and alternatives to guardianship because now there's a greater focus on those issues whenever guardianship is going to be created. Texas uh, has always been uh, a state, like most states, where the least restrictive sort of guardianship possible is mandated because we don't want to take away more rights of an individual than we have to in order to make sure that they can uh, live out uh, productive lives. And so um, as part of that, there should already be a focus on trying to limit what powers are taken away from a ward. And so that you look for alternatives to guardianship because you don't want to have to have a guardianship if you, don't have, if you really don't have to. So uh, there's always supposed to have been a focus on that, but there have been reports of maybe courts not understanding what that focus should be or uh, not, uh, not making sure that that they didn't just rubber stamp the creation of guardianships. And so some focus groups got together and, and, and through a lot of work, this bill came about. And one of the things it does is it, it makes everybody focus more on alternatives to guardianship. And we'll talk about exactly how that comes into play. Uh, the code actually now specifies that an attorney ad litem should discuss and investigate alternatives to guardianship uh, so that they can talk about those with their client which is really something an attorney ad litem should always have been doing. So that doesn't change the law, but now it's there so that the, that the court can maybe help get a bad attorney ad litem to do their job. Uh, this bill also now provides that the guardian ad litem should also investigate those same alternatives to guardianship and supports and services and share that information with the court, which is again what the guardian ad litem should have been doing. So what are some of the new requirements? Well, the one that affects all of us is that now, in order to practice in the guardianship area, you have to have a CLE uh, accreditation of four hours of guardianship CLE. In the past, that's been three hours. So, and now it's four hours, and one of those hours has to be devoted to alternatives and supports and services. And not only do the attorneys ad litem, though, have to have that, but now the new requirement is that anybody who is going to file an application for guardianship for a client also has to have that certification. So in the past, it was just the ad litem. Now it's anybody who's going to be involved with a, a guardianship proceeding ad litem or an applicant. And so uh, theoretically what should happen and what I think is happening with most clerks is that they've got a list of the people who are qualified with this CLE and it's available online so they can always check that. And if an attorney tries to file something and they don't have that certification, they can't accept that filing, or at least you should get bounced back as soon as somebody realizes that. Um, the, it's also gonna change guardianship practice because our forms now need to put a greater focus on alternatives to guardianship and supports and services. Our application has to state that it's been looked into and nothing really fit as far as an alternative at the time that the application was filed. And um, the order that the judge ends up signing 
actually has to find by clear and convincing evidence that alternatives were considered and rejected and because they weren't feasible. So how this actually plays out is going to be up to the courts and the practitioners as to how much actual evidence needs to be presented and heard about alternatives to guardianship. Uh, but uh, it'll usually be a situation, in my opinion, where either alternatives require a lot of time to discuss in court or they require very little time because it's, if somebody is uh, in, a, in a coma and cannot communicate and does not have a guard, it doesn't have powers of attorney, well, you don't need to go over alternatives with them because uh, quite often you, know, you have to create that guardianship. But it's still something that we all have to be aware of and look into. Uh, it also point out that now our application has to state that if somebody's trying to take away a proposed ward's right to make a residence decision, that has to be specifically in the application, just like it used to be if you were going to take away their right to vote or to marry, uh, which you still have to also include in your application. The, um, another requirement that may it'll be interesting to see how this plays out is that uh, the physician certificate that has to always be presented at some point before the hearing on the guardianship application, now has to include a statement by the doctor about whether improvement of the ward is possible, and if so, when that ward should be reevaluated. Now, those of us who deal in guardianships and have talked to doctors uh, know how, uh, how not easy it is to get them to think outside the box and to give an opinion that they don't have to. And so this is gonna take, uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how doctors will fill out this requirement because usually they don't want to go out on that limb and say what is likely going to happen with the ward. Uh, and so, but if, but we still have to ask them to do that and if they think that somebody can uh, be improved, that their condition is gonna improve within a year, they need to also say when they need to be evaluated. Uh, and another interesting thing I think is that now the court can consider the proposed ward's preferred guardian whether or not the ward has, has already signed a declaration of guardian. So one of the common estate planning documents we will have people sign is a, a directive as to who should be their guardian. Well, usually they're signing, they should be signing those when they have capacity and know what they want to have done and, and who they want to be in charge. But if they later become incapacitated and there's a need for a guardianship, it's quite often because they, they're now suffering from dementia and they're maybe people that are unduly influencing them, well now they can actually go in and say, judge, I actually want the bad kid who I took completely out of my will and all my documents before to be my guardian, and the court needs to try to consider whether or not that is appropriate. So it just, what this will do is it's going to put a greater burden on the ad litem to make sure that, that if, if somebody is trying to become a guardian who is already disqualified, to really dig down deep into what's going on there and maybe even ask for the appointment of a guardian ad litem to give the court another opinion. Uh, one, there's also some things that are, that are going to now be required about notice. If a guardian is going to place a ward in a more restrictive care facility, they actually have to go to court to get approval to do that unless there's an emergency involved. Uh, another piece of legislation to know about is that there's now a ward's bill of rights that includes 24 specific rights. Uh, similar to a, a, a patient's bill of rights, and it, it's common sense things about treating them with respect and dignity, self-determination, everything are, are good things to know about, but we don't need to go down the full list, but it is in the paper for you to look at. A lot of times I think what will happen is that ad litems or, or guardians want to make sure that the ward has a copy of this at some point, usually after the guardianship is created. Another new thing to know about are supported decision-making agreements, and this is a new thing. Texas is the first state to have these, uh, and what this is, it's been called uh, power of attorney light, but what this is, is it's a way for somebody who is not incapacitated uh, to actually appoint basically a helper, to authorize a supporter to help them make decisions, not to make decisions for them, so it's not an agency relationship as it is with a power of attorney, but it's something to assist them in making their own decisions. And so this is, an, this is, this is good for empowerment, but there are also some issues with this uh, statute that we're gonna try to clean up or discuss in the next legislative session. For example, it gives somebody a lot of power to influence uh, somebody who might be on the, uh, on the edge of incapacity, uh, and yet it does not create a fiduciary relationship. And so that can be kind of scary because there are people who are gonna overreach and, uh, and, and use that to their advantage. 
So, but it's supposed to be a situation where they don't actually make decisions for the person, they're just there to help them. So what does that mean? Well, it could mean they help them go to the bank and they help them uh, place their name, uh, sign the right place on the bank form that helps the other person get their money. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, some other guardianship bills that other people have done, uh, one thing to know about is more about notification. If there is a guardian, they now have new responsibilities to notify a long list of people about changes in the ward's condition. So spouse, parents, siblings, and children of the ward are supposed to be informed if the proposed ward passes away, is admitted to a hospital for more than three days, changes their residence, or is staying at a location other than the residence for more than a week. So this is a lot of, actually quite a bit of requirements there. So, uh, and uh, we'll see how that plays out. There's no, there's no penalty for not complying with those requirements, but it is now part of the law to give a bunch of people notice of what's going on. You know, with, and uh, it may be that not all these people want to know, and if they don't, they can sign waivers to say, you don't need to tell me that, but otherwise there is that duty. Another little bill of ours was to increase the amount that can be placed into a Tutma account from a fiduciary without creating a guardianship from, uh, there were diff two different statutes, but now they're aligned towards $25,000. So if there is, for example, a provision in a will that says that there's going to be money going to a minor, now the executor can, can use that to create a Tutma account uh, if, if that's feasible there in order to uh, up to $25,000 without creating a guardianship. Uh, a few other guardianship bills uh, took place. Uh, the one I'd point out is that now nursing homes and other assisted living facilities have to keep copies of the court orders that appoint the guardian in the medical records. Because what was happening is there were several lawsuits where nursing homes in a defense would say, well, we did not know that we needed to be on the lookout for people who might be taking advantage or harming this incapacitated person because their order creating the guardianship was not in the records, was not in the, in the medical records. We had it somewhere, but we didn't have it in the actual file that was, the, that was there to make the rounds for. So that's a, we fixed that. Uh, the reptile trust bill, this is the one that uh, uh, we worked real hard on, but unfortunately it uh, went away. Uh, we ran out of time to get it done, so we will be back with the next session with some of that. Uh, for you younger folks out there, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> in The Terminator, and he said we'll be back. Um, uh, the uh, one trust bill that did happen was done by the Texas Bankers Association, and you should know that now there's a provision that deals with directed trust. So if you have somebody who is a a trust director, which means that they can tell the trustee what to do or give the trustee recommendations as to what to do with the assets that are held under trust. Uh, what now the law is, is that the trustee is going to be real difficult to hold them liable for anything as long as the trust director told them to do that. So even if the, the, the trustee knows that the trust director is telling them to do something that is, uh, uh, would be a breach of fiduciary duty if the trust director did it, they, can't, they won't be held responsible because they're only responsible if they individually have done something that was, uh, that was part of willful misconduct. If they do something that they are told to do by the trustee, even if they know it's a bad idea and uh, they shouldn't do, then uh, they are, are, they're not going to be held liable for it. So we may try to go back and finesse that a little bit because it seems to open up uh, it seems to give a, it's not, not, maybe not be the best thing for beneficiaries of trust. As you'll see there in the second big bullet point, the trustee has no duty to monitor the advisor's conduct or provide advice or consult with any beneficiary or third party. So if a trust director says, I want you to go and, try, I want you trustee to go and spend all the money to, that, that is there to explore this, this, uh, this dry hole, that has already been dug once, because uh, I really do think there's got to be something down there, then they don't have to warn the beneficiary that all the money's about to disappear. Uh, the, we also had some of our advanced directive bills that was trying to uh, help make, the use, make these more user-friendly for our clients. But uh, again, that one was defeated for a while there. Everybody was against us. We had hospitals mad at us, the banks, the title companies. Uh, and we, we 
were able to get to a resolution, but we just ran out of time. Like so many things that happened down at the Capitol, we ran out of time to get things accomplished. And this, this screen was much more timely back in June when the new Terminator movie was coming out. So, um, the, um, uh, I want to bring up a few more issues. So one thing that we did get passed was our reptile disposition of remains bill which now provides that executors are added to the long list of people that can determine what happens to a person's body uh, if there is nobody else in this long list to say what should happen with the disposition of remains. Because before, it would happen that if there were no relatives, then, then funeral homes didn't know what to do. Well, now executors and administrators can come in as a last resort to say, you have authority to cremate the body, to bury the body, whatever the issue might be. And one other thing that we did is we clarified that um, the authority that might have been granted to a former spouse terminated upon divorce. You know, we thought it was a, probably a good thing that the ex-spouse did not have the ability to determine what happened with the former spouse's body. So we have clarified that that power ended with the divorce. Uh, there are a few definitional changes in the advanced directives that, well, that changed things like Artificial nutrition and hydration is now artificially administered nutrition and hydration. I don't know why all these nuances were necessary, but they are law, and you need to make sure that your forms have those. Um, the, uh, we, had a, we had a small bill dealing with non-testamentary transfers to make it cl clear that whenever the state's code talks about uh, payable on death accounts, it also includes transfer on death accounts. Uh, the one thing that is going to be new, a new tool for, uh, hopefully for low-income folks, is the transfer on death deed. So there's a uniform act that deals with transfers on death deeds that will uh, be useful if, for example, if somebody's only asset is their home and they don't want to hire an attorney and don't want to have to go through probate, they can now create a deed that says, this is going to go to whoever I name, upon my death, as long as they file that in the real property records before they pass away, it is revocable, so they can go back in and change it. And more, even though there were ways to do uh, new non-probate transfers of real property before this, title companies did not like them and would not honor them. But title companies accept and were part of the, uh, at least the legislative process that got the transfer on death deed passed, so that is now something that is a viable alternative. Uh, one thing that also happened is that now there's going to be a form initiative for certain simple wills and muniments of title and small estate affidavits, similar to what happened with the family law bar several sessions ago. The Supreme Court has now been directed to promulgate forms for things to deal in the probate world, uh, with the goal being that you create some documents that can be used for low-income individuals, and uh, the hard thing there is to make them useful while still complying with the law and still being understandable to the people that might use them. Uh, and there's been you know, some flack about that. Some people don't like it uh, in, in our practice areas. And I'd point out that the people that are going to use these forms, uh, there's two main groups. There's folks that, that we intend for these forms to be used for, low-income people that otherwise would not do anything and aren't going to be taking away business from anybody. Or they're going to be used by the same people that are buying uh, legal Zoom kits or just downloading things from the internet and filling out their own wills, which create even more problems for us. So now at least there will be a way that there are certain state bar forms for those for the cheapskates that want to just uh, download those forms. But it will also help out the people it's intended to help out. Uh, and this wasn't a reptile idea, so don't think that we were all, we, we definitely wanted to see these forms created. But we realized that it was something that could benefit Texans, and we wanted to be part of it because we felt we had a lot to share. The first meeting of that was actually yesterday before I got on the plane to come out here, and so we spent four hours uh, discussing it and looking at some of the forms, and we got through three lines. So <laughs> hopefully it'll pick up steam. Uh, the um, uh, quick little point, uh, the reptile exempt property bill has now increased the, the value of stuff that someone can have that is exempt from creditors. So it used to be either 30000 for an individual or 50000 for a married couple. So this would be things that creditors could not uh, take uh, 
because it's exempt, like the furniture, car, things like that. So the values have gone up because of inflation. So we made that happen. Um, the judge has also added on to our, our guardianship bill recusal provisions because what has also been happening in some of the major counties are that people would file motions to recuse a statutory probate judge and say that they, they shouldn't be hearing this contested case, this contested will contest or contested guardianship. The problem is that it was ripe for abuse because there aren't a whole lot of statutory probate judges, and so if somebody was willing to risk their own reputation and file a recusal motion, they would keep on doing it. So they'd have these serial recusal motions, and ultimately it slowed down the process and hurt the people that were really trying to get, get justice. And so now it's a little more difficult. So now if, if there's a recusal of a judge filed, then when the judge hears that, when the person appointed to hear the recusal motion hears it, they then make a determination and they can say that if this recusal motion was done in bad faith, they can assess attorney's fees against the person who brought it in bad faith and they can also prevent it from being, uh, from other ones being filed by that same person. So I haven't act, I don't know if anybody's actually used that. Um, if anybody's even filed a recusal motion since this became law in September, but it's something that the, the judges felt strongly about. So that is the whirlwind version of what we did in the last session. Uh, this paper is available on Bill Pargman's website. I suggest you go there if you ever want to print it out again or, or send it to someone. And uh, there probably won't be many more updates because the law is law right now, but there might be, so you can always check there for the most current update. Reptil is currently working on our next legislative package, so we we're in the middle, or we're about, eh, maybe about a third of the way through, because we have to do things real early, uh, because we have to get state bar approval. So we're probably not, we're not taking input really for new matters, but if there's any questions that you have or, or ways you think laws can be benefited, feel free to email me, you know, Bill Pargman also, or, or any of the, the substantive chairs. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting process, and we're about to start it up in full force again. So thanks again for letting me be here. You all take care. at PowerPoint. Thank you so much, Mr. Hopper. Our uh, sixth speaker today is Tara Kern. Tara Kern grew up in Frisco, Texas and graduated from Baylor University where she received her bachelor's degree in finance. Tara is currently a 3L student at Tech Law and um, serves as a CE on the Estate Planning and Community Property Law Journal. She mentors 2L or second year students in the development of their comments, and three of her staff editors this year were selected for publication. Before she attended law school, Tara worked for a year as a financial analyst for Thyssen Krupp Elevators, a multinational elevator corporation. Currently, she is spending this semester externing in Fort Worth at Legal Aid of Northwest Texas, where she is working in the Family Law Unit and utilizing her 3L bar card. Last year, Tara received the journal's Outstanding Second Year Common Award for her comment, which she'll be presenting today, entitled Equitable Adoption, the Implications of Common Law Children on Estate Planning, and the Need for Statutory Regulation in Texas. Please join me in welcoming Tara Kern. Is that on? Okay. Hi, like Ashley said, my name is Tara Kern and I'm going to be talking to y'all today about equitable adoption. So basically, equitable adoption is where someone takes in and cares for a child who is not their biological child, and, nor has been formally adopted by the person. Um, and yet, this child is able to inherit from this person's estate as if they had been a natural child or formally adopted. There are three main issues surrounding equitable adoption. The first being that the estate's code section 201.054 and 22.004 do not actually distinguish between a formal adoption and an equitable adoption, and yet the Texas courts seem to um, interpret it as if there is a distinction. 
There's also no st uh, current statute in the Texas Estates Code that establishes the elements for an equitable adoption, which means that practitioners are going to have to rely on case law. However, the case law that is available is not very consistent. So if we take a look at section 201.054, this section establishes the inheritance rights of an adopted child. In subparagraph A, you'll see that an adopted child is allowed to inherit from the adoptive parent's estate, and as well as the adoptive parent is able to inherit from the adopted child's estate. What you'll notice in this uh, statute is that there is no distinguishing um, words uh, distinguishing from an equitable adopted child and a formally adopted child. So if we look at subsection D, it states that the code actually refers to child as is it is defined in subsection 22.004. So if we turn to that section, it actually states that a child, the term child includes an equitable or an adopted child regardless of whether the adoption occurred through a formal adoption or an equitable adoption. However, the way that equitable adoption works is that the adopted child is an, able to inherit from the adoptive parent's estate, but the parent is not allowed to inherit from the child's estate. And it also does not establish a legal parent-child relationship the way that a formal adoption does. So if we take a look at this case law, uh, the first case is Kubli v. Barbie. And in that case, the Texas Supreme Court ruled that in order to determine if an equitable adoption existed, the courts needed to look at the adoptive parent's conduct and whether that conduct implied that an adoption existed. Such as, did the parent uh, take in the child and house the child, feed the child, pay for their education and medical expenses and that sort of thing. However, six years later, the Texas Supreme Court ruled in Jones v. Guy that it wasn't actually the adoptive parent's conduct that the courts needed to consider, but it was the adoptive child's conduct toward the parents such as did the, chair, did the child assume the surname of uh, the adoptive parents? Did they keep in contact with the adoptive parents even after they had grown up, moved out of the house, been married, and that sort of thing? Then in Kavanaugh v. Davis, this case was where an aunt and uncle agreed to uh, take in their niece, and whenever the aunt and uncle passed away, the niece tried to inherit from their estate as if she had been equitably adopted. She went to the court and proved not only that her conduct um, expressed that she had been adopted, but also the parent's conduct toward her. But the Texas Supreme Court instead ruled that there was only an aunt-uncle-niece relationship because there was no actual written agreement between her biological parent and her aunt and uncle. So even though the niece satisfied what other factors that Kubli v. Barbie and Jones v. Guy had established, the court went on its own and decided to throw those two cases out and just rely on whether a written agreement was uh, written or was between these two parties. But then if you look at Brassard v. Weinberger, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals actually contradicted Kavanaugh v. Davis and ruled that no agreement is necessary and it is the conduct between the parents and the adoptive child which establishes if an equitable adoption existed. So as you can see, the case law is very inconsistent and could be uh, very confusing for a practitioner to know how to prove an equitable adoption existed. So in my comment, I drafted a piece of legislation, but I'm just going to highlight the elements here rather than go through exactly what I had written. And so the first element would be that there is a mutual agreement between the adoptive parents and at least one natural parent, either through a written agreement or through clear and convincing evidence. The second element is that a conduct of the adoptive parents must reflect the intent to adopt the child. And this treatment of the child needs to last for a minimum of six months before um, an equitable adoption can be found. And lastly, that there needs to be at least a two-year statute of limitations. As well as proposing a piece of legislation, there also needs to be an amendment to Texas Estates Code Section 201.054 and that the statute needs to expressly include language of an equitable adoption and a formal adoption are equivalent. This is mainly just to clear up any kind of confusion and provide a consistent application of the doctrine itself. So if this legislation were passed, there would be three um, main impacts of the legislation on estate planning. 
First will be that it will maintain what the concept already uh, establishes, that the child, the adoptive child is able to inherit from the adoptive parent's estate. The legislation will also allow for the adoptive parent to inherit from the child's estate, and the child's descendants will be able to inherit from the equitable adoptive parent's estate. So in essence, the legislation is needed in order to clear up uh, the disparity among the courts and to actually support what the Texas Estates Code already establishes and that equitable adoption and formal adoption are equivalent for the purposes of inheritance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. So I know we are all very, very anxious to get out, get out there and have lunch, which is um, ready now, apparently. Um, maybe not. So the, uh, we're gonna need a couple more minutes to set it up. The drivers evidently went to a museum instead of the law school. So um, they're getting that set up now. They have arrived. So if you'd like to um, go out and use the restroom, get a drink, we are gonna have a working lunch. So you can bring your um, meal back inside and Professor Byer will start his case law update around 1240 or 1245. Thank you guys. <laughs>